Welcome to Advance Explored, where every week we'll be talking all things evangelism with Ben Jack. We want to equip you with great teaching about the gospel and your role as its messenger. We want to encourage you with real life testimonies and empower you through the Advance Group's journey. This week, Ben Jack will be looking at the evangelism elephant with special guest Andy Hawthorne, founder and CEO of the Message Trust. Over to you, Ben. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the evangelism elephant. This guy, in fact. You see, we have a little bit of a problem in the church, and that's that we're used to gathering together and we're used to praying together and singing worship to God, but we're not always so experienced and used to sharing our faith with other people. We know that it's something that we should be doing. It's something that we want to be doing. We want to take the hope that we have received, the joy of knowing Jesus, the the transforming effects of his love. We want to offer that back out into the world. And, And who else but us, the church of Jesus Christ, who are to be the light into the world. And yet we do have this evangelism elephant in the church at times because it's, it's not something we always talk about very effectively and it can become a little bit of a problem. There we are all milling around in our communities and before we know it, bam, the evangelism elephant is amongst us and we all start getting worried about, oh, does this mean we have to start going out onto the streets and randomly proclaiming repentance to a world that doesn't really understand what repentance means? Well, we're going to deal with the evangelism elephant today by thinking about whose responsibility it actually is to take the good news into the world and why that is actually good news, not just for the world, but good news for the church, us who get to be part of taking this precious gospel into the world. The way that we're going to do this is we're going to unpack scripture together and we're going to take a little look at Mark's gospel. So turn with me, if you will, to Mark chapter one, and we're going to have a little look at uh, verses 16 and 17 here. So what we have is Jesus having arrived on the preaching scene, proclaiming this very gospel that we're talking about, saying, look, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is basically saying, look, world, you're going the wrong way. You've been walking away from God. You need to turn around and you need to start walking the other way. You need to come back to God. And guess what? Jesus is the way by which that is going to be possible. After he starts preaching this message, he looks around to see if he can find some helpers. And and have a look, look at this section here. It says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. You see that section there. Now, the first thing that we need to look at when we see this passage is that Jesus sees individual people. He doesn't see an entire people group. He sees Simon and his brother, uh, Andrew, casting a net into the lake. And this is really important for us to understand because one of the problems sometimes when we're thinking about the call upon the church is that we forget that Jesus doesn't just call a church as a, as a body. He calls individual people with individual skill sets, with individual strengths and crucially weaknesses. He calls people like me, but he also calls people like you. And on this particular day, he sees two brothers, Simon and Andrew, and they are uh, fishing. Why are they fishing? Well, says because they're fishermen. That's the job. That's what they do for a living. And what we get next is the remarkable words of Jesus, who says, come and follow me. Now, we know that the call to discipleship is a call to follow Jesus. He's the centerpiece of our faith. He is the one that we follow. We're not just following a a group of ideas or or even just simply the holy text of the Bible. We're following the reality of a person, Jesus Christ, the incarnate God come to earth, who has always existed, has always been there. Everything that has been created was created in, through and for Jesus Christ. And now in this moment in history, 2000 years ago, he has become flesh and is walking among us. And he offers this call to these brothers. He says, come and follow me. This is the call of the evangelist into the world. But look at these words here, follow me. Sometimes the problem that we have when we hear this call is that we we put a bit of a stop at the end, almost as if that's the end of the sentence and that's the end of our responsibility to arbitrarily follow Jesus. But what does it actually mean to follow Jesus? Well, Jesus goes on to show us that it's a little bit clued in with what comes next. 
Jesus then says, come and follow me because I will send you out to fish for people. Jesus is saying, when, when you come and follow me, yes, there's the salvation stuff. Yes, there's hope for you now to be reconciled and restored to God. We don't get that explicitly in this text, but it's just been a couple of verses earlier that we've heard the repentance message and it will go on to be filled out through the rest of the gospel story and the four accounts that we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and then the writings of the apostles through the rest of the New Testament. We're going to get the full picture of what the gospel is. But it's interesting to me that right at the very beginning, Jesus links the idea of follow him with the idea of being sent by him into the world to fish for people. And then it says, at once they left their nets and they followed him. Now, I've heard this passage preached on a number of times in a number of different ways over the years. And one of the things I think that actually gets missed in this passage is the personal nature. Actually, what we hear is the fishing part of it. We hear this idea that Jesus is calling us to be fishers of people. And so here I am as a follower of Jesus and I'm, I'm trying to fish for people. And I'm, sometimes I have success. As you can see, I'm not doing very well at fishing right now, but I managed to get one. That's great. But other times it's not so successful and sometimes it looks like one's going to come out and then it starts to fall back in and to be honest with you this fishing metaphor is not particularly helpful for us what we need i think is something a little bit more helpful and useful and to help us illustrate that i think we can turn to another game this game right here now, don't worry, I'm not just replacing one challenge with another and thinking, well, Ben, I hear what you're saying. We're to be uh, fishes of people, but not to take that so literally and miss the personal call that we have on our lives. But surely using another metaphor or analogy is going to uh, just cause us more problems. It would cause us more problems if we were trying to locate ourselves on this board. If we were trying to think to ourselves, hmm, if I'm playing the game of evangelism, as it were, which piece Am I? Uh, how can I move? Am I the, the pawn that can take one step at a time or am I the, the really skillful evangelist like the, the queen piece that can move anywhere as long as the board can, can be uh, uh, cleared for me to move there? We start to think, where would I find myself on this board? But the truth of the matter is we're thinking about it the wrong way. The most important piece on the board is the king himself, illustrated by Mario on this board. But I got a more helpful piece that we can use if we turn here and pull this big bad boy in to shot, this is the only piece that we need to concern ourselves with. Why? Because this is the king. Now in chess, the king piece is not super helpful. The, the, the king piece is actually a problem for us because we're gonna defend the king and, and he can only move one space at a time and if he gets trapped, it's checkmate, it's the end of the game. But God is the king in our reality. And actually God is dominant. And when we start thinking about ourselves as pieces on the board, how are we going to move for Jesus? What's my particular strength, my skill, my weakness? We start thinking that the power is ours, but it's not. The power is God's. God reigns supreme in helping us to be evangelists into the world. It's for his kingdom that we go, his kingdom glory, and it is in his kingdom power and strength that we go. And crucially, the call is personal. Jesus called uh, Simon and, and, and Andrew as fishermen using that metaphor because they were fishermen. Jesus isn't calling you today to go and make fish, uh, to be a fisher of people because it doesn't make sense to you unless you're a fisherman. He's calling you specifically, personally. One of the first challenges that we have to overcome in thinking about our responsibility uh, to be evangelists and to take the gospel into the world is to overcome this idea that we've got to be this kind of pawn or, or this kind of uh, a queen or whatever role that we have and be like this type of evangelist. We, we don't. We have to trust the king for his power to send us into the world as we are, but being transformed daily to become more like him. You see, the second that we start thinking it all hinges around us and our skill set, the second that we miss that it's always about God, the king, his power, his glory, and he calls you personally to go into the world and make his good news known. I asked Andy Hawthorne what he thinks might help certain people discover that they have the gift of the evangelist to go beyond being witnesses of the gospel and being evangelists with the totality of their whole lives.
So here's the big question. How do you actually know you're gifted as an evangelist? And I think the answer to that question is twofold. The first thing is you'll be passionate. You'll be passionate for those who don't know Jesus. It will bug you and bother you that there are so many people who've never heard the good news in language they'll understand and you'll be determined to do something about it. You'll be passionate. It's actually the passionate people who change the world, of course. So if you're not passionate for the lost and the least and the last, get passionate. And that's the great starting place. The first thing is you'll be passionate. The second thing is people will become Christians around you. You're the sales and marketing operation of the church. You're the recruiter. And whenever you go, people will be recruited to the cause. It may be in small numbers to start with, but there'll be a growing number of people who've become Christians through your life and work. So you're passionate and people become Christians around you. But also you'll model three things, three things we talk about in advance. You model faith. You'll expect people to become Christians. You believe that the gospel still works. Like Paul said in the book, that the gospel's lost none of its power. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. So you'll have faith to expect that. You'll also, secondly, be able to communicate it with clarity. Not with weird religious words that put people off, but normal, ordinary words, but words communicated in the power of the Spirit. You'll have a growing clarity in your communication so people can understand. And the third thing, as an evangelist that marks the guy or girl who has the gift of the evangelist is, you bring the invitation. You'll be willing to invite people to the party. Come and follow Jesus. Give your life to Christ. Get off your throne and put Jesus on the throne because he died for you. He's alive. He's coming back and you need to repent of your sins and give your life to him. If you're willing to bring that invitation, guess what? People are going to come to Jesus. God has planted eternity in us all. And many people are just waiting for somebody to come up to them with a bit of faith to believe the gospel still works, a willingness to share the good news with clarity and then bring the invitation and bang, guess what? The greatest miracle in the world will happen. Is there anything better than that? Go for it. So today we're looking at the evangelism elephant and we've already looked at the fact that when Jesus calls us to himself, part of what it means to follow him is to then take his good news into the world, to become fishers of people in the general sense, but perhaps not the specific sense, because to do so would miss that personal call that Jesus has on every person's life. And of course, it's not simply that we're trying to identify our place on the chessboard. Which playing piece are we? No, it's that we're looking to the king who, unlike on the chessboard, reigns supreme, is under no threat from the maneuvering of the pieces on the board. He is the one that has all of the power and he is the one that calls you to go into the world and reveal his power and his love. And as we've just been hearing from Andy Hawthorne, there are some people that are called to be full-time evangelists, gifted evangelists, if you will. And they might have a complimentary gifting for that task, perhaps an ability to communicate with clarity. Perhaps they head into opportunities that others of us don't necessarily see before us. Although I would suggest there are many opportunities around us every single day that many of us miss, perhaps because we're not looking. Why? Because of that evangelism elephant. We haven't yet got to grips with what is so central to our Christian faith and yet can be awkward for us to think about. But we need to get rid of this elephant and the way that we do it is by talking evangelism. There's only three places in the New Testament where the Bible uses the word evangelist. The first is in the book of Acts. We hear about a guy called Philip who is called an evangelist and we see from his life why he might be called such a name. He's quick to go and proclaim the gospel and lead people to the truth. The second time is in Ephesians 4 and we see evangelists listed as part of the so-called fivefold ministry, gifts to the church, prophet, pastor, teacher, apostle and evangelist. Men and women who are gifted by God for a specific function to help the church to be what God wants it to be for his glory. And the third time that we uh, hear the word evangelist is when Timothy, uh, is Paul rather, is writing to his young protege, Timothy. And in 2 Timothy 4, we get these words from verse 2 onwards. Preach the word, be prepared in season 
and out of season. At this stage in Timothy's life, he's leading the church in Ephesus. He's essentially a a church pastor. And yet Paul is writing to him and saying, look, make sure you preach the word. Make sure everything you do is founded on the word and be prepared in every season of life. We can't always control the seasons of life that come upon us, if ever, in fact. But what Paul is saying to Timothy is the same call that Jesus offered his first disciples. When you follow Jesus, you will go with the good news and it will be in season or out of season. And then Timothy, uh, Paul rather, begins to speak to Timothy and say, look, correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. You see that line there? Now, I think actually I've underlined that in blue to distinguish it from this universal truth at the top. Preach the word in season and out of season. But this blue here just helps us to see that perhaps the season that we're currently in, a specific season, is one where people don't put up with sound doctrine. I think one of the reasons why we struggle to go into the world evangelistically is because we know that the world has all sorts of ideas that are contrary to what we hold true as Christians. And that makes us nervous because we don't want to offend people. We don't want to be considered as as bigots, perhaps. And we don't want to put people on the back foot and consider ourselves to be or present ourselves as being aggressive. Some might even ask the question, is it even ethical? to announce the good news and try to persuade people that the way that they're living is not right. Well, actually, uh, Paul is saying to Timothy here, look, inside the church and outside of the church, there is coming a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine. And the only truth that we have that will set us free is the truth of God. So we have a responsibility to help people understand that truth. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Actually, to suit our own desires, we will do all sorts of things. We will maneuver idols into our lives that help us to live how we want to live rather than how God has designed us to live. Oh, sure, we think it will bring fulfillment, but it never does. It always leaves us unsatisfied. The only satisfaction can truly be found in the truth of God, which is why Paul's saying, preach the word, keep going, keep going, keep going. It's the truth that people need to set them free. They will turn their ears away from this truth. They will turn aside to myths. How many myths are present in the world today? Part of our responsibility, not just people who are called as evangelists, but the whole church is to go into the world and say, what myths are dominating your lives? We think we have the truth. We want to share that truth with you. Keep your head. And again, I'm going to highlight this section here. Keep your head in all situations. Let me pick a better tool for the job here. There we go. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And here, Paul uses the word to Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. Whether you're called to be an evangelist or not, it seems to be that that Timothy's primary call was to be a, a pastor, to lead the church. But Paul is saying here, whatever your calling is, do the work of an evangelist. What is the work of an evangelist? To keep sharing the word so that people can build their lives on truth, not on myth. And this is so important. This is why when we start to address the evangelism elephant in the room, we realize we have to get over some of our challenges. Realize that Jesus isn't calling the person next to you. He'll take care of that call. He's calling you directly to follow him into the world with good news. Why? Because there's people around you who have turned their ears to myth and to untruth and therefore they are flailing around in uh, in untruths that will not set them free, but actually will further enslave them. What we have here is a UK map. Now, wherever you're watching this in the world, imagine your own map. And as we start to think about going into our context, we're filming this uh, right now in, uh, in Manchester, over, over this part of the world right here. And uh, if we look at the map, we might start to think of it as a weather map. It's sunny in Manchester, which is very unusual. If you want a myth, there's a myth right there that it's sunny in Manchester. More often than not, actually, what we get is rain coming down. But we might have different forms of weather all around the world. Maybe some uh, jaggedy lightning there, over there. Maybe it's sunshiny up here in Scotland, uh, heading towards the northeast and up into Scotland. 
The point is, sometimes when we think about going into the world as evangelists, we, we want to almost take a stock, a, a temperature stock of what's going on in the world. And, and if the weather seems good, like here, it's nice and sunny, then great, we'll go and we'll do evangelism. Perhaps our church is involved in something and, and bringing sunshine through unity movements and working together. And it's, it's good. The weather's good for us to go into the world and do evangelism. So we'll go. But if the weather's more like this, cloudy with lightning, oh, it's not the season for evangelism. And that elephant comes back into the room. Oh, it's a bit awkward for us. We'll, we'll leave it to another day. No, Paul is saying, no, forget about the weather. This country, this world needs to hear the truth, whatever the weather, whatever the season, it's every believer's responsibility to do the work of an evangelist. There will be people watching this and God has a call on your life to become a full-time gifted evangelist, to, to travel, to proclaim the word uh, and to have a complimentary gifting to match. But whether you have or you haven't been, God says to you in the person of Jesus Christ, come and follow me and I will teach you to take my good news into the world and send you to take my good news into the world, to make disciples of the nations. And as he says in Matthew 28, right at the end of the Great Commission, surely I, as the King, will be with you until the end of the age. To deal with the evangelism elephant, we've got to talk evangelism, and then we've got to go and be people of evangelism, people of the good news into the world. So I first heard about Avance through Emma Owen. We both go to Poynton Baptist Church and she'd run a number of Alpha courses that I'd brought some friends and colleagues to. So she asked me if I wanted to be part of her group. When Emma first asked me to be part of her advanced group, I wasn't quite sure why she wanted me. Um, she was currently working with people who were band members from The Message and evangelists who were speaking to hundreds of people all, all day long for their job. But what I realised is as long as I'm obedient and willing, God will use me and he will send me. I think the advance has had a massive impact on my life. Before I did the advance, I was um, incredibly shy. Um, I didn't share my faith. And it's just given me the tools, it's just equipped me, it's just given me a boldness to be able to tell people about it. Um, I was talking to a neighbour recently and it, it's one of those situations that I'd normally run away from and it just came up, the opportunity was there and I just was able to share with her that I was a Christian and since becoming a Christian it's changed my life and, and the way in which it could change her life. <laughs> I just think that it is so important that everybody hears the message. They're just, they're lost without that. So I just feel on my heart that we should have um, a boldness about our faith, not keep it to ourselves and just share it with people, tell them about how this God can save us and how he can change your life and transform you. He can give you a worth and an identity. And uh, I just think that is too precious a gift to keep to yourself. Thank you so much for tuning in to Advance Explored. If you want to join an advanced group or maybe even start one, then head over to advancegroups.org and you'll be able to download an advanced group mentoring guide for free and you'll be able to start your journey. We'll be back next week, but in the meantime, stay tuned if you want to know how you can support the ongoing work of Advance. Will you help us take the good news of Jesus to the hardest to reach young people and places? Here's how you can get involved. We long to see our nation transformed by the gospel, and we can only make this happen through the faithful prayers of our supporters. Will you stand alongside us and pray for our work? Do you want to be part of making the gospel known in our families, streets and communities? Then why not get involved in our work? You could join one of our advanced groups, where you live and be equipped to share the good news of Jesus with those you meet every day. By financially supporting the message, you are partnering with us to make the name of Jesus known across our nation and globe. Could you consider setting up a regular gift today? Sign up to pray, join or give at message.org.uk forward slash get involved.